So, how would you explain to me, in a few sentences, your life since you've retired from football? Obviously, being cut short due to the injury you suffered. Turbulent. Ups, downs, mood swings, uh, immaturity, maturity. Just, just gone to every nth degree, really. Is there uh, a moment specifically that is a major up or a major down that you can pinpoint due to retirement or life afterwards? Uh, yeah, I think it was a gradual thing though, until you hit that rock bottom. Basically for me, I, I didn't have anything to, I'd done the same thing that when I was five that I did when I was 32. Then all of a sudden that's taken away. So I was like Peter Pan, I was just, never grew up. Then all of a sudden reality hits and you stop going to school effectively. So all the camaraderie, all the laughing, the joking, the structure in your life just completely goes pear-shaped. And I latched onto a few other things. Uh, addiction, so I was gambling um, to the absolute max. Just to basically, and I understand this now, to, to get away from normality. To try and create a false life, a false world, just like the football was really. But you don't understand that until you get to where you are. Um, and obviously I then sought help and then that brings in the other side of maturity, of being more relaxed and obviously knowing that you don't have to pick up things to survive. So at what point was it that you realised that that wasn't the case? That you were actually alright, you didn't have to go down these almost dark pathways? Uh, no, so every day. Every day I, I sort of have to take it, because it's built in. It's a, me a mechanism that you know, it's like a self-destruct or uh, you have to remind yourself. So basically what you do is you, you start learning tools that you can pick them up when you feel yourself going down a certain road. And that could be impatience, that, that could be just, um, I keep me using the word immaturity because that's quite a good one that brings me back to actually being quite calm and just saying, listen, just relax, don't have to be so hectic. And it's normally the uh, decisions you make when you're hectic that normally go pear shaped So was there, when you were in a, in a up and down place, was yeah. there a specific point you thought, right, this is enough now, I need to sort of, get a, a turbo life around sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I, I sort of help. Uh, basically, I went down the public route. I walked in off the street, straight into the right place for me that I felt, and it was the right place. Um, yeah, it just got, my life become unmanageable. I think that's the best way to put it. That you look at it and you go, I can't do this anymore. And you have to be brave. And basically all your, because obviously I probably lived in denial for, for my, my personal problems, because football masked it. And, and, I, and I, effectively, I was wearing a mask because I was every day that I was going down that road, I was getting further and further away from my true self. But now, obviously, uh, I'm so much better, so much kinder, um, and, and just, just, but genuinely happy for others. So, what is it? Was there any? Obviously, you personally were affected, and was that? Did that rub off with anyone else, like friends, family, any any other implications? Oh, without a doubt, uh, not not really friends. Uh, all those saying that when you go into a bit deeper probably because you when you hit rock bottom obviously it affects your family I mean I, I, I split up from my uh, the mother of my children but I still obviously I believe I've become a better dad uh, even though I thought I was a good dad at the time um, but with friends you notice that uh, they drift away and they weren't really your friends anyway the hangers on or, or just coming along for the ride or trying to or almost like, like parasites so you basically obviously split them up from other children. Was that due to your, how you were after retirement? Was that tied in? Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. And if we were both braver, we probably could have done it years before because it was just, I, I basically created this world and I, be, I think it's fair to say that she probably became addicted to my addiction. Okay, so obviously that's all in the past. You're obviously in a much better place now. What have been the main things for you to get to where you are now, what do you do now to make sure that you don't go back to where you were? Well, I remind myself uh, daily the, 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 the route and, and where I was and why I was. I think it's mostly, for me, it was an emotional transition. If I felt good about myself, then I'm, I feel a lot more in control. When I'm not, I'm happy to self-destruct. And, and that can come in many guises. I could maybe comfort eat, or, uh, it's, it's, or I could uh, over drink. Now I'm not a drinker, so so that really that wasn't a tool that I was ever going to pick up. So it, basically, it's uh, managing my emotions. And if I know and feel that I'm going down a certain road, I don't I, I don't go down. There. So was there help available to you at the time to help you 
transition from obviously your early retirement into your life afterwards, or were you sort of just left out to dry on your own? Yeah, basically, I feel as if I was left out to dry on my own, but there's, that's because no one knows it's going on. I mean, without generalising, I could show you an alcoholic, I could show you a drug addict, but you can't really show anyone a compulsive gambler because that, they wear that mask so well, and I certainly wore it because I became reclusive. And the only people that really knew what I was doing was the people in, in my home. So what, would you, what advice would you give to somebody who's in your shoes, obviously with the injuries suffered, what advice would you give to them now to make sure that they don't almost follow the same path you did and to make sure that they can continue to lead a happy life after retirement? Oh, communication. Communication every day of the week. But basically, as soon as you feel anything like that, then, then you've got to communicate and let them know how you feel. And there is help out there. But it's a two-way thing. If they don't know about it, how can they help? So you've got to be the one who's brave enough to look in the mirror and go, this ain't right, I need some help. And then if you ask, there's a ton of it out there. Right, it's interesting about the help, because when I interviewed Matt, it is, he said that the PFA are reactive, not proactive. Yes, correct. On Monday, I went up to Manchester to speak to a, a mate from the PFA, and he basically was a bit sort of stumped about what to say. Well, of course he was, because Matt was right. Yeah. And Matt's 100% right. Yeah. I mean, um, I obviously went through my bad injury, and because it was my injury was caused by another PFA member, they sat on the fence. Whereas, for me, it was night and day, right and wrong come on take a stance now don't get me wrong they pfa uh, obviously in conjunction with uh, sporting chance but i went through nearly three years of being clean of my addiction week in week out before i went to sporting chance and sought their help because three years down the line of of uh, being clean or, or getting well i realized it wasn't really about the addiction it was about me it was about why i pick up or why I search for something different. So that's when I then started working on me. So for the first three years, it was all about just filling the void, just doing something different. And then once I understood that I, I was doing that well, I then went on to the next stage, which was to basically learn that I've got to change me. And obviously, knowing that you're still really good friends with Matt and I'm sure other professionals, is that, do you think that's played an important part to you getting to where you are now, having those close friends around you that have been in the same sort of shoes going through retirement? I think the big thing for me was, especially with Matt, is that uh, I can talk to him like a brother. He don't judge. You know what I mean? The same as me, I can listen to him and I wouldn't judge. But it just, I would say, that going back to that other question you said earlier about being communicating and talking, they say like a, a problem shared is a problem halved. And, and when you're in, in, in my shoes, or was in my shoes, it's massive. Because you think you're the only one who walked in on the street publicly and where people knew who I was as a footballer, but not as good was. And everyone, they were like churching with a dog when I was talking, because they were all like nodding their head. They all went through exactly the same thing. And when they spoke, I became churching with a dog, because I was like, that's so true. So was that... Going in and speaking to them, was that one of the best things that could have happened to you? Oh yeah, without a Where, doubt. Could that have happened sooner? Oh, without, yeah. If, if I'd have been brave enough, um, aware enough, and not been in denial, I was in total denial. Oh. It was it was just, I thought I was the only one doing this, and because I'd created this false world, I'd gone down that path so far that I wasn't going to be able to just turn around and be okay the next day. I had to basically put the same amount of effort in for the next 10 or 11 years, if I was like an, uh, an addict for 16 years, then, then it's a fair chance it's going to take 16 years before I can actually say I'm not, or I'm just going to be one for the rest of my life, but I'll be one that doesn't use. So would that be, if I was to say to you, would you have done anything differently at the time once you had suffered the injury and realised that you can't play anymore, would that be the main thing you'd do differently, or is there any other little things that you would have done differently as well? Yeah, I, I, I basically, I, it didn't even come into my head. So, first of all, I didn't think I had a problem because I had, I had the three points of the triangle. Time, place, money. I ticked them like triple over. I, there was just, I had everything I wanted to, to continue doing what I, I did. And it wasn't until my life started becoming out of control that I really started to, to think I need help. And, and funny enough, I actually sought help for the wrong reasons. Because I thought that, oh, if I get well, then that will be better for my, my family and I'll be able to live with them. But that wasn't the case at all. I needed to get away and work on me. And, and being in a, an environment for the children and the, uh, the mother of my children, it was best that I wasn't there. Although I was still 
contactable daily if need be. It, it wasn't the right place to get well and it was better for them to be brought up in an environment which was calmer. So looking back, was there a, <clears throat> a key point that you could pinpoint and say that is where it got out of control? That yes, where, yeah, 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 yeah. That was the 13th of December, which I believe is today's date. Is it the 13th today? That's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah 2007, 13th of December. Um, I'd had a really bad run and it, it, got to the, uh, it got to the stage of where I knew that something had to give. I mean, it was just, even if I wasn't gambling, I was doing all the gambling thoughts and all the gambling actions. So again, that's why I said to you, it wasn't just about gambling. Gambling happened to be a tool that I picked up throughout my life. But even though I, you're not actually doing the action, you're still living the action. So, so for me, I, I said, that's it, um, that's enough. And how long from that process have you since been clean and didn't have, like, didn't get all your life as if you're Well, it, it, I've gone, it's, it's really weird now because I, I've put so much work in, I mean, for eight years, not as much as a lottery ticket. And if I go to functions or uh, charity events, I'll buy lottery tickets, but I give them to people on my table. So I've still made my donation, I still feel as if I've contributed, but I don't sit there like that, looking at my win, I hope I win, I hope I win. Because it's not about the size of the win, it's actually the, the being involved in it. But now, now I, I'm, I'm quite happy to say to people that I'm quite happy to have uh, a fiver on the football. Or, because I know it, what it is, it's now not about gambling, it's about having an interest. So if I have a tenner on the football and it wins, it wins. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I, I sort of justify it in a, I could go to the pictures and spend 40 or 50 quid. So I look at it that it's more of an entertainment thing and not gambling. But obviously the business I'm in as well, then, then that's, um, that's something I need to uh, allow myself to, every day to say that that can't happen in my life. So can you touch on the business every now? So you're a very busy man now. So yeah. At least just touch on yeah, well, I'm basically uh, I'm involved in, in the stock market, which, which a lot of people will go, wow, I mean, that's probably the biggest gamble of all. But I, I look at it from a businessman's point of view of doing research and, and I go to the city and I meet uh, board of directors and so there's a long before you actually press the button to invest in a company you've done months and months and months of complete and utter research so so for me that it's a calculated gamble if you like but there's a lot of substance behind it so and, and touch wood it's working out really really well